There's some people that treat the problem of self and not self as a logical problem. First, they define self as something that's permanent. And then you look at the various things that you identify with, and you realize that there's nothing permanent there at all. So therefore, there is no self. So why does that argument not have much force? It's because we don't really care whether the self is permanent or not. We just want to be happy. And our sense of self is one of the ways in which we look for happiness. It's part of our strategy for happiness. There's a self that wants pleasure. And then there's a sense of self as what we can do to or what powers we have to find that pleasure. And then there's a self that watches over all this and decides whether it worked or not. And those are all strategic. And the only way we're going to get over our sense of self is to see that the strategies are not working that there's a better way to find happiness. It's important to note that the sense of self is not dropped until the very last of the noble attainments. Because the teaching on that self is not going to work unless you have at least some sense that there is a happiness to be found. That doesn't involve a sense of self at all, and it's a better happiness. And you've seen it, at least you've had a taste of it. Because even up through non-return, there's still a lingering sense of self. There's a famous passage where Kemaka, an old monk is sick, is asked by a number of monks about his attainment back in those days when a monk was about to die. The monks would gather around and say, okay, whatever noble attainment you've got, put your mind there. And they would ask often, what is your noble attainment? In Kamika's instance, talked about seeing that he did not identify with any of the five aggregates. So they said, oh, you must be an arahant. He says, no, I'm not an arahant. He was a non-returner, and he described what it's like. It was a lingering sense of self, but it wasn't identified with any of the five aggregates, but it lingered around the five aggregates. He said in the same way that when you've used, back in those days, they didn't have detergent, but they had the equivalent of detergent. When you use detergent to wash a piece of cloth, once it's clean, there's still a lingering sense of detergent. You put the cloth away, and after a while that scent of detergent goes away. In other words, there was the self that got you there, the self that developed virtue, that developed concentration, that developed discernment, and it got you to a place that, where there was no sense of self. You saw it, but then you return to the senses, and you return to the aggregates, and you realize there's more work to be done. So that lingering sense of self is still there to do the work. And that's using yourself in a wise way. For most of us, though, we identify with things that are pretty unwise. Like that passage we had just now from the Ratabala Sutta, the four Dharma summaries. You know the story. Ratabala is being interviewed by a king as to why he ordained. He said there were four reasons, four Dhamma summaries that gave him the faith that he had to go forth. The world is swept away, it does not endure. The teaching on inconstancy. And the king asks, how do you say that the world does not endure? Ratabala says, well, look at you. How old are you now? The king's 80. And when you were young, were you strong? Yes. Sometimes the king said, I thought I had the strength of two people. How about now? Oh, no, now that I'm 80, sometimes I mean to put my foot in one place and it goes someplace else. Aging, inconstancy. The next is the world. There's no shelter. There's no one in charge. What does that mean? Here's someone who's a king who feels he's very much in charge. Ratabal asks him, do you have a recurring illness? The king says, yes, a wind illness. 
which basically involved a lot of shooting pains. Sometimes when it's really strong, I'm lying in my bed and the courtiers are standing around saying, maybe this time he's going to die. Imagine that, your king and your relatives, all they can think about is, well, maybe you're going to die now. Get, get out of the way. Rajapala says, can you order them to take out some of that pain that you're feeling so you don't have to feel so much pain? And the king says, no, I have to face that pain all alone. So that's the fact of illness, stress, suffering, and things that are inconstant. The next Dhamma summary, one has to pass on, leaving everything behind. The world has nothing of its own. Here's a wealthy king saying, what do you mean the world has nothing of its own? And Rajapala says, when you, all this treasure you have, can you take it with you when you die? Well, no. So death, not self. And he says the world is a slave to craving. Here's the king, of course, who doesn't feel like he's a slave to anything at all. But when Rajapala quizzes him, saying, if there's someone who told you there was another kingdom, to the east, that you could conquer with lots of wealth. Would you take it? And here's this guy, 80 years old, recurring illness, ready to die. He's just reflecting on the fact that he can't take anything with him when he dies. He'll still go for the kingdom. How about if another person came from the south? Would you go for a kingdom there? Oh, sure. A kingdom in the west, a kingdom to the north? Yes, yes. How about a kingdom on the other side of the ocean? Of course. We look at that and we shake our heads. How blind the king can be. He's just been reflecting on how he can't take anything with him, and yet he would be willing to go through all that trouble just to get more. But then what about ourselves? What are the things that we hold on to? He had wealth. He had power. Ourselves hold on to narratives that are hardly worth thinking about. Some of the things we hold to most tightly are thinking about times when we've been wronged. That's the strongest sense of self right there, very self-righteous, very tenacious. And just like the king, though, where is it going to take us? You hold on to that when you die, where are you going to go? No place good. And here we are, we're not anywhere near death, at least as far as we know, and we're still holding on very tenaciously. At a time like that, when everything is slipping away, watch out for what the mind holds on to. You have to think about other things and better ways of finding happiness, better ways of defining yourself. It's only in that way that this problem of self is going to be solved. Unfortunately, the solution, not self, is something we have some experience with, things we've learned to disidentify with, seeing that it's not worth it. Simply, you know, the Buddha is asking us to be more systematic about it, because we can go through the day and the line between self and not self gets moved around quite a lot, like playing a game of football where they keep moving the goalposts. Someone's a good friend, and all of a sudden they're not a good friend, then it becomes not self, the other. And then become a good friend again. Then they're part of your, your circle of friends again. And the Buddha is saying, look at these things that you hold on to, and then apply that analysis of the five steps. And this is why it's so important that he talks about self not so much as a thing but as a process of I-making and my-making. He says, notice what originates it. How does it come about? What sparks a sense of self? And when it goes, how does it go? When it comes back again, how does it come back again? We talk about the ego. It's a role 
you can say the ego as a role, but it's a role that we pick up and put down. And we pick it up again and we define it in different ways. We have lots of egos, lots of selves. So you want to notice when you pick one up, especially one that involves suffering, why? That's the next step. You've seen the origination, what causes it. You've seen the fact that it passes away. And then when it comes back, you go for it again. What's the allure? Because there are a lot of things we identify with it. When you really look at them, they're not worth it. The king at least had treasures. He had his kingdom. But what are your treasures? What, are your, what is your kingdom? Sometimes you look at the things you hold on to, and it's like looking at a pack rat's nest, or the weird little things that it's gotten from around the house. And then you hold on, hold on. There's that sutta where one of the Buddha's disciples is talking about how, with some people, they're very wealthy. very high status, and yet they find it easier to give it all up and go and ordain. There are other people who are really poor. We're talking about a man who has a little hut, not the best sort, has a wife, not the best sort, has a pumpkin, squash, not the best sort, and then he can't let it go. You have to realize that the tenacity of our attachments has very little to do with the real worth of the things we hold on to. There's a lot of what the mind tells itself about them. In the case of the poor man, his attitude is, if I don't have this, I have nothing. Something is better than nothing. So it holds on. As for the wealthy person who can let go, he realizes, if I let go, something better is going to come. So that's what you have to look at. When we talk about looking at the drawbacks of things, it's not only seeing the negative side of a particular activity that the mind does, but it's also realized that if you engage in that kind of activity, you're missing out on th some things that are better. In this case, you hold on to your old narratives. It's preventing the mind from settling down finding some peace, finding some quiet in the mind. It's preventing the mind from gaining some insight, some discernment. And when you, the mind doesn't have any concentration or discernment, there's no way it's going to have an experience of the deathless. As John Mahabur once said, if you could take the deathless out and show it to everybody, nobody would want anything else. The problem is that it's within the mind of the person who's experienced it, or it's to be touched there. And nobody else can know. That's why we say bhajatang, it's individual. So as we practice, we have to have the faith, we have to have the conviction, yes, there is something better. So that when we look at the various strategies we have, and this has to do with however we define ourself in any interaction with anybody else. We have to realize, okay, the things we think we're doing that are defending ourselves, keeping ourselves safe, are actually getting in the way of a truer happiness. And the part of the mind that clutches to those old habits says, well, if I don't have these old habits, I'm exposed, I'm vulnerable. And maybe in the beginning, as you're learning new skills, you don't feel quite as at ease practicing those new skills. So there's a sense of feeling exposed. But you're not being exposed just for the sake of being vulnerable. Some people talk about being vulnerable as, as an ideal state of mind, being open and vulnerable. It's, it's stupid. The Buddha's not going to leave you exposed. He's actually giving you something better, a better way of protecting your happiness, protecting your well-being. But it requires redefining your well-being, what really is well-being, and realizing that some of your old skills are actually getting in the way of finding that well-being and protecting it. So you have to be willing to feel a little bit exposed for a while as you master the new skills.
and they're mastered, then you do have a sense. It is possible to find a, an experience of the deathless. And we come back from that. Your relationship to all the other things you used to identify with is quite different. As I said, even with that first taste, there, there still remains a, a lingering sense of self. Some people say that stream entry is when you see there is no self. But if that were the case, why did the Buddha have to give the not-self teaching to the, the monks who had already gained the dhamma eye after getting the first sermon? There's still that lingering sense of self. But it's lingering around in a lot more skillful ways, even if, if you don't let go totally. The fact that you've had that experience of the deathless means that your relationship to things you used to hold on to is very different. You're much more likely to hold on to worthwhile things. And you look at the old things that you used to hold on to, the narratives of being abused and being victimized and having to fight, fight, fight for yourself. No longer hold any interest. As I said this afternoon, you look at them and it's like a dog finding a dead bird and rolling in the dead bird. It loses its appeal. It loses its allure because you found something better. And through finding something better, you develop dispassion. And through dispassion, you're freed. So that's the logic of not-self. It's not a syllogism. It's more strategic. You see, the Buddha says, you do want happiness, he honors that desire for happiness, but he says there are better kinds of happiness and there are better ways of getting there. And when you see that the things you've been holding on to, the sense of self you've been holding on to, is actually getting in the way. It's interfering with happiness. It's not bringing you happiness. It's interfering. When you see that, that's when you let go. That's when it makes sense to let go. So in the meantime, work on trying to identify with what's skillful in the mind. Disidentify with what you can see is not skillful. Say as when you're practicing concentration, anything that comes in to interfere with the concentration, see it as not self, not self. And if there's any sense of self lingering on the concentration, okay, make it skillful. That way you're not totally set adrift. And you begin to see that the, what the Buddha is teaching you really is for your own well-being. He really is on your side. He's not trying to strip you of anything valuable. He's just showing that the things you're holding on to are really not worth it. There are things that are a lot better. And he shows you the way there. So it's good to question your sense of attachment, to be open to the idea that maybe the Buddha's right. 